Oh, I'd say very good friends. Uh, this is Dr. Mark Carrera and oh, Jason Sloop. Yeah. Okay, and I need that. Mark is a physicist turned cyber analyst. Jason is an aeronautical engineer, also turned cyber analyst. Uh, Jason works with the cyber assessment program in support of dot &E. uh, Mark works mostly naval programs, but we're all part of the OED Cyber Lab, uh, along with some of the other folks in the, in the audience here. And I'll just let them take it away. Okay. So hopefully this works fairly well. Um, we're going to have a couple of live demonstrations, which is always uh, a bit nerve-wracking in front of a live audience. Uh, and because of that, we, we have some laptop switching that has to occur. Uh, so hopefully we can get my slides pulled up here. Hey, perfect. OK. All right, so please forgive any uh, technical issues that we have here. We're going to try to make this work uh, and make this an interesting discussion to close out the day. Um, I know it's the last, last presentation of a long day of talks, but hopefully we can provide some interesting concepts for you to consider as you uh, go forth and do good cyber testing. So as Pete introduced, uh, Mark and I will be presenting, but this is a collaborative, uh, a collaborative work with the rest of the Cyber Lab team. So we also have uh, Lee Allison here and Kelly Tran and Vince Bass. Um, we, put, uh, we have a lot of thoughts and fun ideas that we've been able to throw together in a cyber lab. So if you're an IDA researcher, come visit us and you can learn how to hack. Uh, if you're not an IDA person, still let us know and we can probably get you in to learn how to hack things. Uh, so today we're going to look at um, hacking RF frequency enabled devices. Okay? So uh, just to baseline everyone, um, the RF spectrum is a fairly small part of the total electromagnetic spectrum, but it really has a lot of practical uses. Uh, Mark will give a couple of demonstrations today that shows you how busy a lot of the spectrum can be. Uh, but just to give some context, uh, on the left side of the slide, you have things like maritime radio navigation, very long distance communications that occur over RF. And on the other end of the extreme, uh, uh, on the other extreme end of the spectrum, you have things like satcoms uh, and radio astronomy. So uh, to give you a few points of reference. Um, unfortunately, we all just have paper tags, but when you go back to your office and you scan your badge in, that authentication is probably occurring over RF um, using a card reader that looks very similar to that and over about 125 kilohertz. Uh, most of us have uh, RF-enabled key fobs for our cars. Those are about 315 megahertz. And uh, probably a lot of Bluetooth devices in here as well that operate a little higher at 2.45 gigahertz. So RF devices are great. They uh, have enabled a lot of capabilities. Um, it makes working out a lot less boring and dangerous. Uh, but any RF communications also present adversarial uh, opportunities to affect the devices that we rely on. And of course, since this is DataWorks, uh, there's a lot of defense uh, applications to needing to secure these RF devices. But really, everything we present here, you can think of very similarly to wired communications. So if you're designing a test that has wired communications, also consider RF uh, as it, it probably going to be important for your system. So I'll motivate this talk uh, with two uh, real world examples. Uh, so the first example of you know, RF uh, vulnerabilities would be things like personal, uh, personal devices, Internet of Things devices. So uh, what's shown on the slide is a Simply Safe uh, home security system keypad. This is the uh, I think it was called Simply Safe uh, Original or something, but basically this keypad here, um, it communicates with its base station over unencrypted traffic at 433 megahertz. And after some reverse engineering uh, and open source investigations, researchers found that when you armed your system, it sent an unencrypted communication to your base station that basically said to everyone listening in range that my system is armed. Not only that, but it also gave the pin to your keypad, okay? just broadcast over RF. Uh, the problem with this is it was not fixable through an update. Uh, but fortunately, simply save version 3. If your keypad doesn't look like this and looks a little newer, you should be OK from this as they've encrypted the traffic. Um, remember that bottom line. It's going to come up very frequently. All right, second motivation. We are just across the street from Reagan National Airport. Uh, air traffic controller towers communicate with the aircraft that are coming in over a technology called ADS-B. Uh, it's the uh, automatic uh, dependent surveillance broadcast system. But aircraft are required in the US to use this system to give information like uh, 
aircraft IDs, speed, location, and altitude to air traffic, controller, air traffic controller towers as well as other aircraft. This is done over RF at 1090 megahertz. Again, these are un unencrypted and unauthenticated messages. Part of that is unfortunately by design, but that does lead to possibilities for attack. So this is uh, research from uh, an open, open literature publication. You can go and find it. And the top left figure, uh, I'm sorry, top right, uh, the figure at the top shows what can happen if I were to throw out messages in the right format to a system that's expecting to receive these. I can flood that screen with false tracks. I can make it look like there are thousands of aircraft in the air. Uh, alternatively, you can perform some other types of flooding that completely eliminate all tracks from the screen. And of course, that would be an issue for an air traffic controller tower that's trying to maintain situational awareness of all the aircraft in the area. Uh, this, there's, there's other stuff like message injection, message deletion. Um, there's actually, actually active research going on uh, with ads B to try to figure out how to do this because it does need to be unencrypted and unauthenticated by the nature of how the aircraft are communicating with each other in the towers. So hopefully these two motivation, motivating examples highlight that anyone with the proper equipment can capture, alter, and perhaps disrupt signals from RF devices. Uh, so I've put up here three examples um, that I'll use similar terminology through the talk. We'll talk about sniffing RF signals. Uh, this is a completely passive attack where anyone that is sitting in the, in the space where these RF signals are emanating can capture and listen to that traffic. Uh, we will also talk a little bit about message injection uh, today. And then, of course, uh, you know, jamming is always in the movies and in the news, uh, and that's simply just flooding the RF spectrum with information. So as I mentioned, today we're going to focus on sniffing and injection, and this is specifically using the RF spectrum to transmit network data. Okay, so there's a lot of other applications to RF communications and capabilities, but here we're going to be tra uh, transmitting network traffic like you would over an Ethernet cable. Um, now, it's not all doom and gloom, uh, fortunately. There are ways to protect yourself if you're using RF signals, uh, and I'm going to highlight two in particular, encryption and shielding. Um, but as you are looking to test these systems or design these systems, you just need to plan for how an adversary might interact with your system and with the signals that you're uh, emanating. So for the sniffing and injection we're going to talk about today, encryption is, is a great protection option to, to secure your communications. Uh, we'll talk about shielding, not here, but in our poster session uh, after this uh, seminar. But there are, are also other capabilities to protect your signals. Uh, for jamming, that's a pretty complicated and technical topic. I'm going to leave that to the electromagnetic spectrum operations groups. They're much more uh, well-versed in protecting against jamming attacks. Okay, so that gets through some of the boring, you know, uh, baselining everyone in the audience. Now we're going to get to some of the demonstrations, and this is where it gets a bit... Uh, uh, nerve-wracking for Mark and me. Um, so we're going to have two live demonstrations and one that's just a PowerPoint slide. Uh, but for these, we're going to do a passive Wi-Fi sniffing uh, attack. We're going to do an active Wi-Fi injection attack. And then we're going to show some, th some possibilities that you can do with software-defined radios. And that's really the focus of our poster presentation uh, later this evening. Okay, so the first uh, demonstration is using a small hobbyist drone shown on the slide here uh, that communicates over Wi-Fi to a controlling device, which in this case is a phone. Uh, what's important for this demonstration is the uh, drone captures video and transmits it to the phone, uh, and it does so over a Wi-Fi signal, 2.4 gigahertz. It's what most laptops can communicate over. Um, it, you know, it's... Uh, it, very common and uh, pervasive technology. The other very important part about this drone is it has an active set of users and hobbyists, which will highlight why that's important as we get to uh, the second demonstration. So I need to explain a little bit uh, to hopefully calm some fears uh, how Wi-Fi works and how we're going to make sure that we're only sniffing information from the drone and not all of our devices in the room. Uh, so Wi-Fi operates over a a small range of frequencies from 2.412 to 2.472 uh, over 13 channels. And so when your device is communicating over Wi-Fi, it is using a specific channel that it tries to figure out which one is, is uh, not busy to reduce interference. 
So when we start our sniffing here, the first thing we're going to do is find which channel the drone is communicating with the phone over and then listen only to that channel so we reduce the amount of, of data we collect. And then I do want to highlight, Mark will also point this out in his demonstration, that the only data we're recording is coming from the, the drone itself. Okay, So hopefully that allays some fears. If you have questions about how we implement that later, come talk to us at the poster session. Uh, but what we're going to do is we're going to passively sniff all of the Wi-Fi signals in this room. We're going to specifically capture the channel that the drone is communicating over and dump all of the drone's traffic to Mark's laptop, you want to hold it up, to this laptop, and we're going to record that data. Uh, once we're recording that data, we're going to look at the files and find some pretty interesting information. And using some open source tools, we're going to reconstruct the video feed that was transmitted from the drone to the phone, but it will be reconstructed on the laptop, which is completely separated even from the Wi-Fi. It's not connected to the drone or the phone. All right, Mark, you're up. You make it sound so easy. Yep, it's trivial. OK, let me plug it in. Yep. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Mark. Uh, so for the next 20 minutes or so, I'll be playing the, the role of a, of a hacker. So oh, hold on one sec. I like to play the stereotype, so you know I got to put this on. All right. OK, so um, let me take you through the script that we're going to run. So, so this is the script. Um, so what we're going to do, uh, so there's some bookkeeping at the front. That's, that's not a big deal. So there are open source tools for Wi-Fi hacking, injection, and so forth. And they're very common. They're, not, they're probably on pseudo app get if you want them. So uh, first things first, we're going to go off and put the computer in monitor mode, right? So normally. You ignore messages that aren't meant for you because you're a good citizen. Let's not do that. Let's listen to everything we can. Um, we're then going to take that data and listen for all the traffic and only pick out uh, devices that, uh, uh, that correspond to the Tello, right? So this is uh, this over here. I'm looking for my Tello Wi-Fi network. Um, I'm then going to ask, hey, which channel is that on? Let's sniff that channel. And now we're going to take all that data and dump it to a file. And then we'll, we'll go around and see what's in that file, and we'll play around, and we'll see what we see. Don't save that. OK. All right, so now it's, now it's sniffing. So let me turn on my drone. Let me turn on the phone. Oh, and by the way, you know I'm not collecting this data, but there's a lot of phones in the room. So let me quickly. Before I do that, all right. So you can see up here that the drone is operating on channel two, right? So that's the Wi-Fi channel. It's at the very top of the screen. You can see the ID starting 6060. That's the drone and the channel it's on. So let me get my phone up and start flying the thing and hopefully not crash into anything. Do, 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 do. The drone's right here. Give me one second. I promise, it's here. All right, so the drone's up. And you know, I can move it uh, left and right. Can I even do a full come back this way? All right. OK, so now, so going back to the, our, our, uh, our laptop, I want to sniff on channel two. And you can see we're collecting data frames, right? So let's look at this, say hi, everybody. And let's stop collecting. OK, so we collected some data. Let's see what we got. Oh, that's going to be a binary. So let's go into Wireshark like any good script kitty would. All right, so you can see we've, co we've captured a bunch of traffic, right? And so we, this was an open Wi-Fi network. This is why you don't trust hotels and their open Wi-Fi networks. Um, and you can see uh, a couple things, right? So there is the source and the destination. Um, so those are. Uh, uh, which drone, so one and three. So one is actually the drone, and three is the phone. Um, we can dig in a little more. So going into the logical link layer, uh, da, 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 where is it? Man, I love live demos. They're great, yeah. All 
No, I have a script. One second. Ah, layer two. There we go. There it is. Okay. So you can see, hey, that's a Motorola phone. So that's the phone and its MAC address, its hardware address. You can see the transmitter address, which is this SJ, SDJI. So this is a Rise Tello. It's actually made by a company called DJI. So it's kind of dual-headed. Dual and you can see MAC addresses. You can see source IPs and so forth. And so what I, what, what I want to look at are, um, again, the IP addresses, the MAC addresses, and uh, these numbers over here, which are the ports. So it turns out if you do some digging, this channel is the C2 channel. So that's how I tell the drone how to fly. Uh, this channel is actually the video. OK, so now the scary part that I really hope works. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to run a script that is uh, effectively going to take the file that I, just, that I just captured, replay it, do some parsing. So I'm going to only look at port 7777, which is the video. Um, take some of that data, do some parsing, uh, some cuts and stuff, just whatever, to get that into a format that can play as a video. Oh, no. Uh, OK, so let's try that one more time, because I never learn. Thank you. All right, we're still on channel two. We go up and we go down. Hey, video works. Woo! Right, and so you can, you can see it's a bit fragmented. Um, so that's because I'm just raw dumping the UDP, uh, the, the hex, right? I'm not trying to parse it. If I was a little more clever and had a little more time, I could probably make this a little cleaner. Um, so yeah, you can see, right? This is, this is just data that's out in the air, right? And so it's not just the phone, it's the drone, it's all of your phones, thank you. Um, and so I'll let Jason get back to it. All right, that was the, uh, the challenging one. The next one should be much easier. <laughs> and hopefully the slides come back up. All right, perfect. Okay, so Mark highlighted a number of things uh, in the packet capture that he showed in Wireshark. We'll come back to the drone and phone MAC address and IP address in the next demonstration. But really what he was able to show is that without connecting to the drone itself, we were able to recapture or capture and replay the video. So what can you do to protect yourself, everyone? Encryption, Encryption. yes, thank you. Uh, if you encrypt this traffic, it will be much more difficult to capture and replay it as an adversary that's just passively listening. Uh, when you implement your encryption and when you're testing uh, systems to try to figure out what possible vulnerabilities you might have, make sure you know uh, what encryption method you're using. Use encryption methods that are not easily broken, MD5, or I'm sorry, not MD5, um, WEP, W-E-P, very old encryption for Wi-Fi signals, please don't use it. Um, also make sure that your initial uh, connection to a remote site is also encrypted. In other words, it doesn't help if I s tell the entire room, okay, Mark, our communications are going to be encrypted with the password of uh, cranberries, right? Because then anyone could, listening could just say, oh, well, I know the password, therefore I can decrypt it. What works better is to give Mark something that only he can decrypt, and then we start communicating over that and all of you are still in the dark. So make sure the entire uh, connection is also encrypted. Uh, but when you're implementing these in systems, encryption does not come free. Uh, more stringent encryption methods are often uh, more power intensive, processing intensive, and can be time consuming. So make sure you choose something that's appropriate for your application. Okay, so the second demonstration, we're going to be doing an active Wi-Fi injection. And this is where the hobbyist part of this drone really comes in. So if you look on the internet, uh, which we all know that things that are on the internet are supposed to be on the internet, um, you can find instruction manuals and uh, very detailed technical descriptions for this drone. And in particular, uh, if you look uh, at the, let's see, where is it? Uh, there it is. Okay, 
So at the bottom of uh, the, the little cutout here is a data field. That's the, the data that the packet contains that Mark was, was showing in Wireshark. And part of that includes the commands that are sent to the drone. Okay? This is unencrypted, unauthenticated. Uh, but hobbyists have essentially broken out all of these fields and put that information on the internet. So if you know where to look, you actually know what commands are being sent to the drone. Okay, so if Mark moves the drone forward, you would be able to find the packets that are telling the drone to move forward. So this is really interesting. So what we're going to do in the second example is now we're going to join the network to the drone from Mark's laptop. So now the drone will be able to communicate to both the phone and Mark's laptop. But what we're going to do here is we're going to spend, send a specifically crafted message using that open source information to the drone to cause it to uh, do really whatever we want. And in this case, we're going to send an emergency stop message, which will completely kill the motors and make the drone fall out of the sky. Okay, so um, let's look at the actual script that we're gonna run, right? So this was, I think it's, I don't even know what I named my own script. Oh, there it is. All right, so we're gonna use uh, Python. We're gonna use Scapy. I'm, I'm, bu I'm building packets. That's relatively straightforward, right? Um, and so all of these parameters that I have selected, these come from that packet capture. I was able to sniff that data. I know the phone Mac, I know the drone Mac, um, I know the phone IP, oh, that's interesting. This is supposed to be a three. Well, let's change that and see if it works. And I know the drone IP, right? I know the drone, the drone port, the phone port. And so all I'm gonna do, I'm gonna take all that information and build up my UDP packet just as, as I should, right? So layer two, layer three, got, it's got the MAC addresses, got the destination and drone phone IPs, the source IP, um, and then the ports, right? So we'll get that, put it all together. And then here's the actual command to do the shutdown, right? So I spent some time, you know, making it stop, recording, figuring it out. And effectively, the important part here is the uh, x00, x19. So right here, that is the abort command, right? So that should, if properly processed by the drone, because the drone should obey my, obey my commands, should stop the drone. So we'll put it all together, and then we'll just send it. And we'll see what happens. Okay. You know what, yeah, why not? Please don't crash my drone. And by the way, this drone was a COVID project because I was so bored at home. I highly, 100 bucks, highly recommend. There it goes. Hooray. Hooray. All right, the hard part's done. Smooth sailing. Okay, well, maybe getting my slides back will. Uh... All right. Um, this horse is very much dead at this point, but from this, Mark was able to. Uh, connect uh, to the drone's network, encrypt the initial connection so that an adversary is not able to do this. Uh, and in addition to that, uh, you should probably also encrypt the commands that are being sent in case someone can figure out a way to get your drone or your device to accept any commands that are sent to it. So, uh, you know, the, I'm going to keep harping encrypt communications when possible. Um, in addition, you should probably also consider anti-jamming techniques. Uh, if your device is receiving RF signals, um, it's very possible that someone could overwhelm the good commands uh, so that then your device becomes unresponsive uh, and is no longer uh, mission capable. Okay, so to the last quote unquote demonstration, this will uh, highlight some things with um, what you can do with software-defined radios. So a software-defined radio is an implementation of radio technologies that use software components to replace uh, previous hardware components, so amplifiers, demodulators, uh, and so forth. Um, what this allows for is a single 
device that's very flexible in what it can process, what sort of signals it can send and receive. Uh, and there are just a couple of examples here. Um, ADS-B uh, decoding is often done over uh, SDRs. Um, chances are a lot of uh, AM, FM radios and vehicles these days use SDRs. Uh, but the bottom one here, which is bolded, uh, you can also use these two, similar to our first demonstration, just sniff whatever is around, okay? So what we're going to do today is look at uh, signals that are emanated from sensors in cars. So most vehicles from the mid-2000s on, uh, I think, are required to have tire pressure sensor monitor, or tire pressure monitor systems, TPMSs. Uh, TPMSs relay the pressure in each of your tires to your car, uh, and because your tires are rotating very quickly, it does this over RF. Uh, and so the, the computer in your vehicle will take the signals from each of these sensors in your tires, which, by the way, have individual serial numbers so that your car knows it's your front right tire that's low on air, uh, and it will display that onto your dash and perhaps give you a warning if you have uh, low tire pressure. Uh, so your car is doing all of this using uh, software to translate these messages into a readable format. And so we're going to leverage the information that the tire pressure monitors are sending to the cars, which, again, unencrypted, uh, unauthenticated to the complete open, uh, open air. Um, chances are your vehicle already knows the serial numbers for uh, the sensors in your car. That's why when you're driving down the road, you don't get someone else's tire pressure showing on your vehicle. So what Mark did for this demonstration, we didn't want to drive a car into the building. Security probably wouldn't like that. So we pre-recorded some data and just have it shown here. Uh, but the snippet at the top uh, of the slide is just the command Mark ran. There's some software that's freely available. You tell it to listen for an RF signal at a certain frequency. So here we're recording at 315 megahertz, uh, which is the frequency that the TPMS uh, reports at. And this particular piece of software knows that this signal uh, and certain aspects of the signal that it's receiving are associated with tire pressure monitors. So what's shown in the middle of the slide is a, an excerpt from the data that's recorded, uh, and it shows Mark's tire pressures uh, from his vehicle. Uh, it shows that his tires are fairly well inflated. Uh, the temperature measurements are not quite right. Um, there's some decoding that has to happen here. Some sensors might send data in different ways. So you might have some ex uh, anomalous readings, but what's really interesting, to me at least, is that it reports the ID uh, of each of these sensors so that your car knows which tire is low on air. Um, this is fairly benign, right? I don't really care if you know uh, what what my tire pressure sensor's ID number is, but there might be instances where you do care about what information you're sending out on RF, okay? And this is, again, um, we have an RF or a, a, a software-defined radio that we'll have set up uh, on the second floor, uh, and it's possible we might be able to get tire pressure sensors from the street driving, uh, from cars driving on the street outside. So we'll, we'll set that up and see if we can collect some live data and see what vehicles are out there driving. Okay. So to kind of summarize, RF is very useful, and we're not advocating to stop using RF, and that would be a, an absurd request to make, but really you should be aware of what you're transmitting, uh, not only from a system design perspective, but also from a testing perspective. As you're developing tests to, uh, to look at systems, don't just consider wired communications as your way into uh, a network. Consider how an adversary might be able to get into uh, your system over perhaps RF communications. Uh, so again, at the top, know how the data you're transmitting is encrypted, how it's encoded, frequencies, everything. You need to know your system in order to develop tests to secure or to show how a system is resilient to these types of attacks. Uh, again, as you're designing these tests, think like an adversary, think like Mark. Uh, put on your black hoodie and say, what could I do with the RF communications coming from the system, and how can we use that to target and affect uh, the mission of that system? Uh, but, of course, this really requires knowing your system well and identifying all sources of RF transmissions. And don't limit yourself to just uh, looking for ways to inject network traffic, like I mentioned earlier. Consider other impacts that RF injections could have to that system. And really, at the, at the least, please encrypt uh, communications. I'm, I'm going to end it with that because uh, that should really be a key takeaway from all of this. Um, so. We're happy to answer questions that you have from these demonstrations. We went very quickly. There's a lot of technical information. Um, 
I'm going to try to steal the, can I steal the slides back because I do have a plug, thank you. Uh, we do have our poster session set up. Um, one of the cool demonstrations that we have uh, is when you put an HDMI cable into a monitor, uh, turns out that it leaks RF uh, signals and you can pick those up remotely and get them to display on another computer. So come up to the poster session. You don't have to stay for the entire two hours. Uh, and we'll show you how you can pick up a video signal from, how far do you think? 20 feet, 30 feet? We'll see. We'll see how good of a day it is. But we'll show you how you can set up a wireless monitor with just an SDR. From my office to my driveway. Yeah. Uh, please, any questions, comments you have, we'd be happy to, uh, to answer those. Now we can put the data work slide up. <laughs> Your names are on the slide, so don't make it too hard of a question. <clears throat> uh, Peter Mancini, IDA. <laughs> um, well, well, you did all this with uh, pretty cheap equipment and all open source information. Um, do you think this kind of testing would be viable in an operational test, for example? Is this technology available for them to do this kind of testing? So that's a good question. Uh, to provide some context, um, Besides the drone, which is just a system that you know anyone would be acquiring, there was no cost to any of the demonstrations here. It's just open source software. Uh, well, I, I guess the demonstration for the tire pressure monitor system had some cost. So our poster session where we're using that SDR and antenna was $30 to $100 maybe Amazon, for the entire. If it was Amazon two-day shipping, 30 bucks with an antenna. Yeah, so antenna SDR uh, for about $30. Um, you'll probably see some limitations to our demonstrations. Uh, I have seen open source reporting. Um, a lot of it is, you, if you look into the funding sources, comes from uh, different uh, uh, countries' military funding sources, but it's still open source. Um, they are able to uh, do this demonstration, the, the monitor... Uh, um, it's not an interception, but uh, get the monitor to show up on a uh, just passively sniffing system from 80 meters uh, over like a, a fairly um, clean environment. I'm not saying like laboratory clean across a courtyard with a tree and a few like uh, building walls and windows. Man. So 80 meters for that. Um, yeah. So what you're, what you'll find upstairs, right? It's the the clarity will be limited by the bandwidth of the SDR, right? So $30 gets you a two megahertz bandwidth or you know, two mega samples per second, you can, ha you can get things, you spend, you spend five grand, you can get 60, 70, 80, right? So think about what that does for your resolution. And then get a good antenna, not one that is like, you know, your parents old, you know, <laughs> rabbit ears, and you can do a lot better, so. 10K and you can do a lot of what we're going to be showing uh, and probably get very, very good results. I'll also say we are not doing anything with transmission. We are just receiving because we don't have licenses and all of that. Um, but also consider transmitting RF signals and what you might be able to do uh, with, with that as you're developing these tests. And then, of course, go and get the right authorities to transmit on whatever frequency you're doing. Thanks.